Boundaries are a decision to live within the world as it really is and a refusal to live out of fear, to live out of resentment, to outwardly maybe look like you're being nice and compassionate and servantly, but on the inside, you're just kind of boiling with rage or fear or frustration. Hello there, welcome to Friday Reflection. Today we're talking about boundaries. And I kind of used to hate the conversation around boundaries because I didn't really understand what they were. And they seemed just kind of like these self-congratulatory ways of being rude to people. <laughs> like, I, that, that was my perception of them. Like, every time I've seen someone, like, I'm setting a boundary. It was just them being rude and, like, demanding that the other person do it the way they saw fit. And it was, like, manipulative and just, like, I don't know, really off-putting. And so I, to be honest with you, I didn't really give much mind to any discussion, like, around boundaries or even as it presented in psychological literature, just kind of avoided it altogether because I didn't really see the utility in it. It just seems like a way of being rude. But lo and behold, I found this book by um, uh, Cloud and Townsend, yeah, on boundaries. And it totally changed my perspective. Like it was pretty wild. So it's, it's written from a Christian perspective, um, which was meaningful to me being Christian. And it was just, I don't know, when you grew up in like kind of a religious background, there's a lot of language around preferring others before yourself. Um, you know, true love is laying your life down for a friend. And there's it kind of opens you up to a lot of potential boundary violation, uh, value boundary violations, because you don't, um, you don't see the utility or the necessity to really shut down or say no to somebody who might be taking advantage of you because you're supposed to be servantly. So if, um, if that book sounds interesting, I totally recommend it, pick it up because it's super helpful. Um, so here's, here's kind of what I want to do. I want to maybe unpack for you what boundaries are, and then I'm gonna share a vignette with you. Um, vignette just meaning like a fictional story with fictional people about two people interacting and then uh, the boundary violations that are implicit within that interaction and then maybe how they could be solved with a better use of boundaries. So uh, what are boundaries? Boundaries are not lying to each other. That's what a boundary is. A boundary is a refusal to mutually manipulate each other into a place that neither of you wanna be in. <laughs> and uh, and I'll show you kind of how that works um, here in a minute. Boundaries um, are a decision to live within the world as it really is. And, um, and a refusal to live out of fear, to live out of resentment, to outwardly maybe look like you're being nice and compassionate and servantly, but on the inside you're just kind of boiling with rage or fear or frustration. So that's, that's what a boundary is. So let's break this down. Let's say um, there's a man named Bertrand. We'll call him Rand. And his wife, Karen. Now Bertrand, if, if you were to look at Bertrand, you might see a man who is wearing a crisp polo, some jean shorts, and some crystal clean white New Balance tennis shoes. Karen found a look that she liked in 2001, and she's kept it. She has not deviated. She has a haircut that she likes. She has clothes that she finds flattering, but she's gonna stick with it. Okay, cool. So we're viewing Karen and Bertrand having an argument, and let's say that they're having an argument around Rand's refusal to pick up his clothes, maybe just to pick up things around the house more generally. And uh, maybe Karen views this as, as quite messy. And Karen um, really has a high value on wanting to keep the house clean and make sure that everything is presentable in case company were to come over. Um, and so she gets quite upset with Rand as he kind of doesn't really take into consideration where he's setting things down or if he puts things back, put things back after he uses them. So they get into an argument, and you might describe this argument as fairly cooperative on the outside. Um, Karen comes after Rand and says, hey, you need to pick up your coat. You left your coat on the, uh, on the table. And then he might roll his eyes and, uh, okay. And then he goes and he grabs the coat and puts it away on the rack. Um, he forgets to take off his new balanced tennis shoes as he walks in the house. And Karen goes, ah, 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 shoes. And he gives her a look like, and takes off the shoes and puts them away. 
And Rand proceeds maybe to go into the garage, open up a crispy boy, which is his word for beer. And he spends the rest of the afternoon alone in the garage, reading a book or doing whatever he finds pleasing for himself. Karen feels really frustrated because Karen, all Karen's trying to do is create an environment that's clean and that's okay. And she feels that Rand is punishing her for nagging him by just totally ignoring her for the rest of the day whenever she finds some ways that he can improve. Rand doesn't see it that way at all. Rand is just trying not to make things worse. Rand kind of perceives Karen to be in a bad mood. Um, there's times when she's more nitpicky or naggy than usual, and so he's just kind of waiting for the storm to pass over and just kind of waiting for things to calm down so that he can engage with her again in a time when she's at a better mood. Now, can you see how the two are mutually lying to each other? Hmm. How is Rand lying to Karen? He's not, um, he's not on board with her cleaning um, standards, hasn't expressed to her his frustration with her constant reminders and with the details of things like wearing shoes in the house or being able to set your coat on the table when you come in the door. Maybe he has a totally different perspective on what should be the standard, but he hasn't expressed that. He's just conceded to Karen's demands. Now, why is he doing this? Um, he justifies it with wanting to be a kind husband, wanting to be accommodating. Um, wanting to be someone who, you know, isn't rude or, you know, kind of harsh with his wife. He has a value of being, um, you know, a kind and compassionate person. But if you're being honest with himself, he's not putting his coat away or his shoes away out of this warm, kind, compassionate disposition. He's actually doing it quite resentfully with a lot of anger, with a lot of um, fear that she'll get more and more angry and intense and then she'll start yelling and then it'll be a whole thing and it'll ruin the rest of the day. And so he's just appeasing her out of a heart of resentment and fear. That's not love. That's manipulation. He's acting in a way just to appease her temper and it doesn't have any sort of motivation of kindness or love behind it. And that might be a harsh word, manipulation, but if you really think about it, that's what manipulation is, is trying to change the environment with a lie so that you can get a result that you find that, you're, that you want. So how is Karen manipulating Bertrand? And she is, you know, she is manipulating Bertrand. She, uh, well, in two, two departments, there needs to be maybe a different mm, way of acting. Uh, the first would be when Bertrand goes off to the garage, she interprets that as him punishing her and him getting back at her for being naggy. And that interpretive structure that she's put in place results in a lot of resentment and frustration in her. And so the next time that she takes off or he chooses to not take off his tennis shoes, she's really angry, but she's not just angry about the tennis shoes. She's angry about the tennis shoes and the night before when she felt like she was being punished for trying to keep the house clean. And so she is maybe especially more intense today than she would have been. And she's responding to more than just the immediate thing. And Rand, in response to that, feels like a really like heightened sense of intensity over something fairly like mundane, like shoes. And then feels like, oh, okay, she's in one of her moods again. And then just retreats to the garage. And it's this cycle. It's this cycle of lying to each other. And of not just being honest about what each person is perceiving. And so Karen needs to be up front and just say like, Hey, when you go to the garage, are you like punishing me for being an ag? And then he would respond, no, no, I'm just, it seems like you're kind of in a bad mood. I just want to let the storm kind of blow over. And then she's like, I'm not in a bad mood. What do you mean? And then he could say, well, it feels like you're really intense about that stuff. And then she could respond and say, well, I feel like when you go into the garage, you're punishing me. And so I feel especially hurt. And so when I see the shoes, I'm not just responding about the shoes. I'm responding about really just kind of this whole environment of me feeling kind of dismissed and, you know pushed away from you and really at the end of the day I just want to be close to you hmm. and then maybe the solutions of what to do about the shoes become more evident because maybe the argument and the responses to the argument don't have a lot to do with the shoes at all maybe it started that way but it then became this whole cycle of just how to interact and how to be close to the other person and maybe a proper boundary to put in place would be <clears throat> I'm not going to um, 
dance and this manipulative, like, kind of weird cohesion that, that we've put in place so far. Like, I'm going to say the truth, even if it creates conflict, even if it creates more contention over shoes, and we really have to hash out, okay, what are our standards for the house? That I'm willing to do that. I'm, I'm not going to just let you escape to the garage. I'm, I'm going to try to engage with you in a way that's low intensity and that, that doesn't maybe inspire a lot of fear so that we can actually get to the bottom of something. Hmm. It's a refusal to not live in the dance of the lie and to interact with the world as it really is. Notice that there wasn't any, like, ultimatums in there. There wasn't any you got to act this way or else. It was a statement about the self. It was a statement about like, okay, this is what I'm not okay with anymore. I'm not okay with lying to you, and I'm not okay with being lied to. Like, we're going to have to figure something out. And that usually means more conflict in the short term so that you can have less resentment and fear in the long term. And that's the utility of a boundary like that, of maybe like an emotional boundary of saying, I'm going to speak the truth. Hmm. Now, there's boundaries that could be put in place if that conversation doesn't work. Uh, that maybe are more stern. So like, for example, like, let's say they have the conversation, they agree on the mutual, like, understanding that, yep, we need to keep the house clean, but Rand still won't, you know, put his clothes in the hamper. They, they, they're all kind of around the hamper. They're in the vicinity of the hamper, but they're not in the hamper. And, uh, and again, they've, they've had multiple conversations, Karen really working to bring, like, to lower the intensity. There's not that kind of stonewalling and retreat, you know, thing, but but just genuinely ran just as forgetful and just doesn't really see it as a high priority. She could respond with something like, um, okay, I, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do the laundry. That's not in the hamper. <clears throat> um, I'll do the laundry if it's in the hamper, but I'm not going to do it if it's not. And then maybe a few weeks go by and Rand is like, Hey, none of my clothes are clean. And then she's like, remember, I told you I wouldn't do the clothes in the hamper. And then he might be, well, why'd you draw an ultimatum? Why are you manipulating me? Why are you doing this? And then she might respond. I'm not manipulating you. I'm telling you the truth. I'm just not saving you from your consequence. I've been saving you from that consequence. I've been the one who, who picks up the clothes and puts it in the hamper, and I'm not going to do that anymore. Um, and I told you that. I'm being totally upfront. I'm not trying to, like, be sneaky. I'm not any of that. Just telling you as it is that this is the, laun the laundry that I'm willing to do is the kind of laundry that's in the laundry basket. And... Um, that's the difference between like an ultimatum that's manipulative and trying to like strong arm the other person and a boundary that's actually for, like effective and that encourages intimacy. It's, it's an invitation into participating in an environment within a dance that is actually beneficial for the whole, for each person in it, not just beneficial for one person's selfish idea of what they think they want. Um, it's a way of presenting, you know, your wants and desires not masked in this kind of lie and in this web of like trying to get the other person to do what you want, but just up front and in plain view. And, uh, and in situations like that, it can be helpful, although it's not usually the first resort. So maybe that's an explanation of how boundaries can work between our fictional characters, Rand and Karen. Thanks for joining for uh, Friday Reflections. Go ahead and uh, mention stuff in the comments. I'll be in there answering questions, or if you want to continue to kind of tease this out, I'd be more than happy to have a conversation about it. So, uh, have a great week.